Alrighty, I guess we'll get started then. Hey everyone, welcome to my next Shmup Saga episode. This is Shmup Saga Ketsui. If you haven't seen it before, I've done a previous episode in this format called uh, Dodon, the Dodonpachi episode. And basically what the idea here is that I am going to take you through this game in extreme detail from not only the scoring systems and the kind of strategies and gameplay of the game, but I'm also going to get into a little bit of the scoring information around the game. Unfortunately with shmups, since their scoring is not as well documented as stuff like speedrunning, you know, the histories, I can't really do a sort of speedrunning type history video, which was what I wanted to do originally, but instead what I do is I kind of talk about the players that we are aware of and talk about the videos that do have an impact on other players and stuff like that. So we kind of try and work that information in, but it's not going to be as direct as something like summoning salt or those types of things. So let's get started by talking about Ketsui itself, right? And so looking here at this image, just looking over the history of Cave and the games that came out before Ketsui. So their first shmup, Dodonpachi, of course, or Donpachi, I mean, and then Dodonpachi, 1997. Steep Slope Sliders, gotta love that, in 1998. I kind of want to give that a try, to be honest. Esperade, 1998, um, and then, I don't know about that one, and then Dangun. And all of these ones are coming out on the Cave 6800, or 68000 hardware. And so what's really interesting, and then Pro Gear comes out on the CPS2, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I gotta love Steep. Have you played that, Flow Steep Slope Sliders? But anyway, so Ketsui is one of the three shmups that came out on the good old PGM. And I actually have a PGM sitting here next to me. I'm not going to get up and grab it. But I, and I also have a video about how you can get your hands on a PGM and actually play affordable bootleg versions of Ketsui, DOJ, and Escaluda, which I think are three amazing shmups. So when you think about an investment, I mean, you're getting three killer shmups, you know, arcades. And so Ketsui came out in 2003. It's sort of the middle child of the PGM games. Ketsui is a very interesting shmup, I think, in Cave's library, where it has a lot of unique aspects that they never really quite returned to. Not only, of course, the lock-on system, which a lot of people will be really familiar with, but also stuff like the bullet designs and a lot of the ways they do the bullet patterns and bosses. A lot of stuff feels very unique compared to the rest of the library of Cave, and I think that's a big reason why so many people want or wanted a sequel to Ketsui, where uh, you never really quite got that the same way you did with the Dodonpachi series. In my sort of tier list of favorite Cave shmups, Ketsui is definitely up there. I don't know if Ketsui is my third favorite, maybe? My first favorite is Dodonpachi, of course, and then DOJ is my second favorite. Perhaps Ketsui is my third, but there's some other ones that I like a lot as well. But as far as being considered among the best, I know that Ketsui is often considered one of the best shmups ever made. It's considered one of the best cave games as well. Um, it kind of trades places a lot with DOJ and Futari. And so that's you know, a little bit of history about Ketsui itself. I think it took a little bit of while for the Western scene to get their hands on it. And, you know, 2003, that's uh, a pretty early game. I always kind of remember Ketsui as being a later title, but it really isn't. So I don't know why I always think that. So there's a little bit about the history of Ketsui. And so I want to begin by talking about the systems of the game, kind of getting a real 101, because a lot of people will say Ketsui is a very simple game, and it is. But at the same time, I've always had... A hard time quite understanding how the scoring system works but because it has got some fine points and nuances that I want to try and help illuminate so I want to begin by talking about the ships what's really unique about Ketsui even compared to other cave games is how simple its ship selection is they are just two ships and there's just one type of each ship where in Dodonpachi you have you know a, B, C, but then you have the subtypes of A, B, and C, right? With the shot, the expert, the laser, or in DFK, they even have their own little different subtypes. But I've always kind of liked how Ketsui has a very simple, straightforward ship selection, 
and I would say both ships are actually really good and so let's begin by talking about the most popular ship by far, Tiger Schwert. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, one thing about Tiger I do have to say too is among all uh, shmup sprite designs, the Tiger sprite is one of my favorites. I think this is one of the coolest looking player sprites in shmupping history. The Tiger, you can't go wrong with it. And so I did a little bit of frame data type analysis with the ships to kind of put some numbers to a lot of this stuff that people will say. So the type of ship that the Tiger is, is it's sort of like Type C in Dodonpachi, if you are familiar with Dodonpachi, where it has a bit of a slower movement pattern or movement speed compared to the Panzer, but it has this massive spread fire. And actually, if you look at this little uh, chart here, what's interesting about it too is it kind of widens out the further it goes. So depending on the range you're at, sometimes if the enemy is kind of close into your peripherals, it is a, you have to move aside to hit them, whereas if you're all the way back and in the center, you can pretty much cover the entire screen with your fire. So that's pretty interesting how it kind of waves out like that. So in Ketsui, like many cave shmups, it has a lock-on concentrated fire mechanic. This is something like the laser in Donanpachi or if you play Toho games, concentrated fire. So what it is, is if you're pressing rapid so shot, which is C, or if you're hitting the regular shot A really fast or have turbo on, you'll do your rapid normal shots as you see in that picture there. But if you hold it down, that's when you activate the laser, that's when you activate in this game, it's a kind of lock-on laser, it's actually really unique and we'll see more of it, we'll see plenty of it in the videos we watch. But what I was really interested in looking into is, is there a difference between the time it takes to switch from rapid fire to that initial lock on? And then you'll see in the next slide if there is a difference. But on its own, Tiger, it takes 26 frames to switch from rapid fire to lock on shot. So that's about half a second, right? And then to activate the initial lock-on takes 32 frames. And then what makes Tiger pretty interesting is that it has a faster lock-on speed than Panzer. So at about third screen, to get all these little options on the side of you aimed and shooting at a target, it takes about 88 frames. This is very dependent on your positioning where if you're closer, it'll be less and if you're further away, it'll be more. So this is not an exact science. But for this, I chose the exact same spot and setup so that we could at least compare the ships. Also, you'll see here, this is the hitbox size of the Type A ship in Ketsui. Ketsui has an extremely small hitbox. This scan is actually taken from the DS game, but it, from what I understand, the hitbox is the same across both. So. That is unusually small for these kind of early cave games, right? Dodonpachi, I believe, has a bigger hitbox. It definitely feels like it has a bigger hitbox when you play it. I'm pretty sure it does. So that's Tiger. Uh, any thoughts on Tiger or questions about him before we move on to Panzer? Alrighty. So up next we have Panzer Jaeger. An extremely cool name. I can't decide which one I think sounds cooler, Tiger or Panzer, both very cool names. And so the style of ship that Panzer is, and of the two I have to point out, and you'll notice this as we go through this saga, Tiger is probably twice or three times more popular than Panzer. So many more players play Tiger. What's interesting though is in Ketsui, I have seen different super players play both ships where they'll have high scores in both. I don't think that's super common, but it's definitely more common than I've seen in stuff like Dodonpachi, where that seems to almost never happen, right? And I think it's because the ships are a little bit more universal with each other. Some of your strategies, of course, are going to be quite a bit different, but I don't think it's as drastic of a shift as playing like the A-type and the C-type in Dodonpachi or something like that. So Panzer is the faster ship, but with the nerf or with the drawback of having a much narrower coverage with its shot so you can see here in the picture this is the size of the shot and when you can compare it to the pan uh, tiger shot see tiger has a much much wider spread than panzer but 
one nice thing about this though is that it is more damaging so if you hit something with that uh your rapid shot it's going to do more damage than tiger's wider shot you're just going to have less coverage uh, less screen control with smaller enemies and stuff like that so the movement speed with uh tiger oh, i forgot to mention this with panzer and tiger so the movement speed with panzer is 32 frames so that's crossing from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen i did frame events and counted them it takes 72 frames where with panzer it takes 92 frames or with Tiger, I mean. So there is a pretty significant difference in movement speed between the two ships. The startup lock is 26 frames. That is the same as Tiger. So basically, if you're just switching to rapid, from rapid to lock shot, that switch is going to be identical between the ships, which I think is a good idea because it makes the movement feel more consistent across both of them. And also the initial lock on animation. So basically, the time it takes to get that target to appear on an enemy is also 32 frames so those are actually both the same the huge difference though comes in the full lock-on so basically the time it takes for panzer's options to all lock on and fire in unison that takes 105 frames from the area i tested at where you compare that to tiger which take 88 frames so that is the sort of drawback with Panzers. It has more difficulty switching lock-ons as quickly as Tiger does, which kind of makes sense because looking at these sort of numbers, I did this to sort of try and illustrate the differences in their playstyle, where Tiger is more apt at screen control, kind of controlling the center of the screen. Tiger can be a little bit more passive, can hang back a little bit, be a little bit more defensive and things like that. Panzer, on the other hand, because of its speed and because of its narrow screen control and its slow lock-ons, this ship needs to be very aggressive. It needs to get in people's faces or in enemies' faces. It needs to get there fast and it needs to lock on close. So I think Panzer is actually a, a really cool ship to to play. And I did a little bit of a one-all. So um, yeah, I think both ships are very very good. I've had conversations with different players about which one is better. Uh, it feels like Tiger is probably better, but there's enough debate between people that it seems like it's not completely clear which one's better. And I think that's really that really shows how well designed and well balanced the two ships are. Where if you can't come to a consensus or a strong consensus on which one's better, I think that's a very good sign. So that's Panzer. So now let's start talking about the scoring system of the game. And the first scoring, so what's interesting about Ketsui is depending on the loop you're playing, the scoring system is going to change. But we'll worry about that when we get there. So we're going to talk about the first loop scoring system, which is very well known for its chip system. So what is this chip system? What it is, is that in order to collect these chips, which are scoring items, you need to be close to the enemy in order to get the maximum amount of uh, points or value of the chips so basically the proximity you have to your enemy when you shoot them with your rapid shot is going to give you a different size chip so I did this little illustration here you can see all the way out here this is just at the beginning of the stage if you hit him all the way out here about this distance you're gonna get a tiny little one chip if you hit him about this sort of you know a little bit closer you're gonna get a two a little bit closer you get a three Fairly close, you get a 4, and then basically extremely close, you're going to get that 5 chip. The goal of a player is basically to get as many 5 chips as possible. Um, that's what you're going to be going for in the first loop. So that's just an illustration of how that looks. Then also now, I want to go over the heads-up display and what all this, you know, all these numbers and boxes and spinning dial shit seems to say. So I was pretty confused about this for quite a while until actually doing more research. It's really not that intrusive while you're playing, and so it's actually pretty easy to not pay that much attention to what all these numbers and stuff mean. But um, yeah, I'll go ahead and break down what all this is. So at the top here, this is just your overall total score, very familiar. This is pretty much every shmup, you're going to have a total score up top. And then of course the little baby, sh little baby ship icons, those are your life counts right your stocks whatever you want to call them and so this top row here 
is called your stage total. I've heard to I've heard or read that it, it was called the boss counter or something like that on the the farm and stuff. But the M2 port refers to it as the stage total, and I think it being called the stage total makes a lot more sense because you accumulate these points while you're in the stage, not on the bosses. I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the next section here, but yeah, so this top row is your stage total. This is going to carry throughout the stage. It will reset. I believe it'll reset if you die. And it resets between stages. So it's not like Gawenge where you carry this through the entire game or something like that. And then the next one below is the rate counter. So this one is definitely the most confusing one, but also extremely important. So what the rate counter is, is it's a number that goes up it's a multiplier that goes up when you kill enemies with your rapid shot. Um, and it goes down when you hit and kill enemies with your lock-on shot. And so this is what you're going to... And it, it's a multiplier that adds to your stage total, right? And so the strategy with Ketsui and the scoring is basically trying to balance where you're killing enemies with rapid shot to not only get the bigger chips, right? but also to build up this rate counter and then you cash it out with your lock shot to get more points and stuff like that during your chip during the next thing here which is the chip rate counter so what the chip rate counter is is it's kind of like a little bit of a uh, a chaining system or it's a little bit of you can create little chains with this counter here and that it is uh, bumped up by using your lock shot and stuff like that Actually, let me pull up the exact numbers here so we can go over the, the exact numbers because I got them written down. Okay, so looking at the rate counter, when you're hitting enemies with your lock-on shot, it goes down 3% for Zako or smaller popcorn enemies. It goes down 5%, I'm, I'm assuming per frame, for larger enemies, so stuff like those carrier, not a carrier ship, but stuff like the, the helicopters and stuff like that, 5% for those, and then 10% for bosses and mid-bosses. So basically, the larger the enemy, the more it's going to take away from your rate counter when you hit it with your lock-on shot. So th those are the exact numbers there. And then, let's get back to the picture here. So... The idea is you kill an enemy with the rapid shot to get the five chip going. And then based on what your rate counter is, you maybe want to keep doing that to build up your rate counter. Or you want to cash it out by switching to lock shot and killing enemies and these flurries of chips and stuff like that, as you'll see in the gameplay. And then below we have the max uh, bomb here, or the bomb counter, sorry, which maxes out at six. So we got all these little slots. And what's interesting about the bombing system in Ketsui is that unless you're going for an aura loop, bombing in this game is not nearly nearly as punishing as it is in something like Dodonpachi, where that basically murders your score. Uh, yeah, bombs are not all that valuable for scoring. They do have some value, but it's not as much as you would think. And actually, Moglar mentioned that if you're playing in a mote or going for a mote, you, there's actually some score bomb setups that you can do in the first loop, I believe in stage 1-5. So the bombing system is pretty interesting. I like it a lot. I like it a lot more than Dodonpachi's where the bombs are holding you hostage with their max uh, maximum bonus and all that sort of thing. And so let's talk about a little bit more about the stage counter here. And yeah, I can actually see the M2 port here. So what happens is you build up this stage counter throughout the stage, you know, uh, with your chips and doing your little chains and everything. And then when you get to the boss, this counter starts to count down. As you can see here, it's sort of rolling down. And so you're in this uh, situation where you want to take out these bosses in a manner that's not going to completely lose your stage counter. So dying, of course, you don't want that to happen. Or if you're taking a super long time, that can punish your score. But you can also sort of milk your stage. You can build up your stage counter during boss fights as well. So whenever we're watching, when we go to watching the replays and watching the different boss fights, that's something to keep an eye on is watching how they're 
building up or maintaining their stage counter during the boss fight. And I think this is why it was referred to as a boss counter on the farm and stuff like that, is because bosses do kind of test you here, but I think uh, it's actually the stages where you build it up, so that could get a little bit misleading. Okay, so Moglar says on kill, not per frame. Okay, good to know. So, yeah, on on kill, not per frame. I guess that makes sense. Any other questions before we move on to the next section here? Okay, so the last part about this is how these all are added up at the end of the stage. So this is a big part of the scoring where you take your stage total and then you times it by the amount of lives you have, which are then time which are within themselves timed by times by 500 and then added to bombs times 50. So that times 50 is much smaller than times 500. That's why the bombs why they are useful for scoring and stuff. They're not as impactful as you would probably think. But of course, uh, the aura loop conditions make that a little bit different, and we'll talk about that as we get there. But yeah, that's how the little end stage bonus is calculated. And so this next thing here I want to show is some information provided by Plasmo. And now we're getting a little bit into the scoring history of Ketsui where these are people that are within what's called the, the 500 million club, basically. So these are players that have achieved a 500 million point score in Ketsui, which is, you know, a top tier elite score. And so we can go through here and we can see SPS has this massive score. And then uh, we have a new addition to the list, Moglar, he's in the chat. So Moglar was actually Ura, okay. Ura. Guess says it's pronounced Ura. And Moglar was recently added to the list, so huge congrats to him. One of the few Western players on that list. And we'll see a lot of these people's replays as we go throughout the, the video here. But yeah, so Moglar, re the, I believe the most recent addition. And then uh, Pazzi, another Western player that is on this list. So that's really cool for Plasma to hook me up with this. So thanks to him for showing me that. It's kind of like the 600 million club in Donanpachi. I don't know which one is more difficult to achieve. I would kind of assume the 500 mil in uh, in Ketsui is harder to achieve than a 600 mil in Donanpachi, but I'm I'm not entirely sure. But I'm guessing probably so. And then here's another scoring history that Plasma hooked me up with here. Which is, this is good to kind of show some information. I believe this is from JHA. And it's going to show some of the history of people achieving these scores. So KMT here is, you know, one among one of the first to get Amote. Um, I cannot pronounce this guy's name. IMA, I would say that. Yeah, I believe from what I was talking with uh, Moglar, Moglar mentioned this guy was among... Or the first person to get in Aura Clear, right? As we can see here with uh, Panzer. But there's also this guy here who looks like he got an Aura. Oh, ended in 2-5. So he didn't get the Aura. Oh, look. Here we have here. So 2003, we got... I can't, you know, read that name. But it looks like this is listed as the first Aura to all which was in 2003, not long after, I believe that's the same year of the game's release, so that's a pretty fast aura, right? That's pretty insane. This is really cool to go over, and just keep an eye out for the people on this list, because we'll definitely see them as we go along further. I'm seeing if they have any other information I should go over on the list. Okay, excellent. So, 
The last thing we need to talk about before we start getting into the replays. The first pans are clear. Yeah, do you know who that is, Moglar? Since we're on the subject, do you know who the first pans are clear was? Okay, yeah. Yeah, and that happened before Tiger, it sounds like. Which is pretty interesting. You know, you'd think Tiger would be the first to do it. But anyway, the last thing we need to talk about, we're going to go back to this chart here. Is a technique known as empty locking or e-locking. And the reason why we need to talk about this now is because this technique sort of breaks the rules or I don't know if it totally breaks the rules but it definitely subverts the rules of this system and allows players to do all kinds of fun stuff that can push their scores up to pretty pretty insane levels and so what empty locking is I'll explain it theoretically and then I'll go to a little demonstration video that will also explain it but theoretically what it is doing is it's sort of exploiting this rate counter here but also getting your hands on more chips. So how you perform it is when an enemy is... So you kill an enemy with rapid shot, and then during their death or before they die, a certain there's a certain window there, you switch over to a lock shot, which then activates chips that would normally have been given to you if you killed it with lock shot, but you didn't. You actually killed it with your rapid shot. And then you switch out of that before going into lock shot so that you preserve your rate counter. This is going to be something we're going to see a ton of, especially um, in the early stages when they're really trying to milk those milk those chips for all they're worth. And it also allows some other really cool things, like being able to collect five chips further away than you normally would be able to and stuff like that. So let me go over my notes here and show you and uh, say all the different things that empty locking can do. Like I said, you perform it by quickly switching from rapid shot to lock shot back to rapid shot. It achieves the two goals of gaining more chips while also keeping the rate counter from decreasing. So, and also another aspect of this is that the lower the enemy health is, normally the more precise the window for this e-lock is. So it is a pretty technical maneuver to do, which I always appreciate mechanics like that in the game. And then there are certain enemies that have multiple forms that can be e-locked. You can't e-lock an enemy over and over. Basically, um, you can mul you can e-lock the different forms, but you can't repeat e-locks on like higher health enemies or anything like that. And so now we're gonna switch over and look at a little bit of a tutorial here by our own Pazzy. And we can also see the hands, too, while he's e-locking. See right there with this, the way he's moving his hands? Where he's moving in and out of the, the lock-on animation, but also maintaining his rapid counter. Or rep, rank rate counter and if you're needing a really good tutorial on how to do this I think this video specifically is very very useful for that so we'll go back one more time and just review it one more time because it can go by pretty quick But just keep an eye on the, the numbers coming off the top of him. That's his rate counter. And notice how, despite him using lock shot and all that stuff, he's able to keep that moving up at a pretty healthy pace. That's because of the empty locking. He's also gaining, of course, extra chip blocks and stuff that he wouldn't be able to gain otherwise. There we go. Any questions about 
empty locking or e-locking, especially since we have Moglar in the chat, he's going to definitely be able to help us out a ton uh, with understanding it and all that good stuff. Yeah, speaking of taking the crown, Gus, at this rate, I, I don't think it'll be long before Moglar overtakes that and becomes becomes the Westerner with the score. Any questions about empty locking? Okay, if not, we'll start moving into the next section here, which is seeing the replays, right? So let's start off with our first replay is from a Japanese player known as CSG. And I'd like to thank Moglar for the help with a little bit of the bio information about these players. Um, some of this stuff is really hard to you know, track down and get information about. But according to Moglar, CSG has the third highest emote loop, is the only Korean 500 million player. So that's really impressive. I think I actually saw a video of him being interviewed actually. He empty locks as much as possible even when there is a very small chance of getting extra multiplier. So he goes in on empty locking and Moglar said that his stage one is specifically very good. So that's what we're going to switch to now and watch him in action. Tiger player. Who knows how already how much he's building up his right counter and how many chips he's getting. I've always felt that stage one in Ketsui is really well done. It's not. It's nothing like the stage one in Donanpachi, where you just want it to be over with as soon as possible. Notice how many 5 chips he's getting, where there's very few chips that aren't 5s coming into him. Really maximizing the stage. Okay, so with this boss fight, again, he's going to want to try and keep that stage counter nice and high. And I believe he's able to uh, do different milking strats on this boss. I'm not sure what what the strat will be, but I'm assuming that's what he's going to go for. When you think about it, the the stage counter going down during the boss fights is an interesting mechanic as well because it does sort of push the players, of course, to, to play more aggressively and stuff like that. Take more risks that they may not need to take otherwise. So Mogler was pointing out in that run that he was not doing the empty locking on the Zako. Those are the really small popcorn enemies. And from what I understand, doing that empty locking on such low health enemies is extremely technical and difficult. So now we're going to move over to stage 1-2. And the player we have here is RS. RS is the king of loop 1 scoring, according to Moglar. The only person to ever break 300 million in the first loop. 
which is pretty insane. Uh, his aura PB is 567 million. He has reached 651 million aura with save states. Wow. I did not know that was possible, actually. Does not play Omo Omote, to Moglar's knowledge. He has a 600 mil CL in Dodonpachi as well, so this guy is a beast. Let me switch over here. So we go stage one, two. Playing the swag green ship. Another thing I forgot to mention when we we're going over the scoring and all that is Ketsui doesn't really have a rank system. So it's like Dodonpachi in that you don't have to worry about rank. That's something that I personally appreciate a lot. And another reason why I think it's as popular of a game as it is, I do wonder if the lack of rank factors into that, right? I believe he's going to do a setup here that's going to allow him to get even more popcorn enemies rushing down in on him by delaying this tank kill. Because if you're playing for survival, this tank would have been dead long ago. He's kind of keeping it alive to set this up here. See how aggressively you need to play if you really want to maximize the scoring in this game. Whereas compared to a more survival oriented playstyle, there's a lot more hanging back and taking your time and being careful. Here we go with the, the boss fight. This tank boss, even for some experienced bullet hell players, this this boss is uh he's got some tricks up his sleeve. And I always think it's really fun to watch how super players take this dude apart. Because you normally wouldn't do things like that, obviously. Wow, very, very swag dodge there. This this uh, grenade attack gets, you know, gets most people pretty good. I remember when I was interviewing Mog, I expected him to say that he had tri difficulties with it, but he says that he never really has, that the diagonal movements of the bolts don't really throw him off that much. Whereas me, I always am nervous when I'm dodging this pattern. So that was... Really impressive, really impressive gameplay there. So there's stage two. Already things are starting to heat up. That's another cool thing about Ketsui is really not too many of the stages are boring at all. So that was stage two. Up next we have and uh, yeah, let's go through some of the comments that Moglar was making. He's absolutely the expert in this game, so I want to go ahead and reiterate some of that stuff. So Moglar was saying that video we just watched is the highest scoring 1-2 on the internet right now. That's Moglar definitely helped me pick out these runs, so a lot of these are going to be significantly impressive scoring runs. So here we go, we're going to go to stage 1-3. This is my favorite stage in the game, actually. Um, it's a lot of fun to play for survival and scoring. And it will be played by our very own Moglar. So for those who aren't familiar with Moglar, he is a newer addition to the shmupping scene. 
Um, I actually interviewed him on a podcast episode not too long ago not too long back, I think last year, so if you want to learn a lot about Moglar and Kiwi, uh, we did a whole episode. But in my opinion, I think Moglar is a, a prodigy of the genre for sure. I have actually never seen someone pick up the genre and get as far as he has so quickly. Uh, Moglar used to be a speedrunner. Um, I can't remember, what, what game did you run before Moglar? Um, he's also a really awesome dude. Definitely helps me out with all sorts of different projects, not just Shmup Saga. And so, yeah, and I think if Moglar keeps at it, keeps uh, keeps playing at the rate he does, he'll definitely become one of the best Western players to ever do it, in my opinion. And he's already making some cases for that as, as being one of the elite Western players. So, I mean, he's in the 500 mil club. There's not many people in there. So here we go. Moglar, stage three. And he's playing on the M2 port. We'll turn this up just a tad. Yeah, and also keep an eye out for the chat. Uh, I'm sure Moglar is giving his commentary on this run, on this stage specifically, being that he's the person playing it. This point blank up here on this giant plane is always really impressive. So for people playing this game a little bit on the more casual survival level, the thing you want to kind of focus on in this stage is being able to put damage on those carrier ships and those battleships while also making sure to be very careful and precise with your switching between the shots because you're also going to need to keep these smaller enemies contained and suppressed and not flanking you all the time. So here we go, the 1-3 mid-boss. This mid-boss contains a hidden scoring extend, and in order to gain the extend, you need to dismantle it in a specific way, which you'll see Moglar doing here. Uh, this can actually be extremely challenging, and it's a point in my runs that it's always a bit of a two-life swing, where if you die and mess up, you basically lose two lives, and uh, if you don't uh, die and you get an extra life, that's a huge, huge bonus, so Moglar doing that well. Also, I believe if you kill that mid-boss uh, fast enough, it's going to spawn that extra ship that you saw there, which will give you you know, a lot more chips and points and all that good stuff. So, Again, this game is just pushing you to play aggressively. That's what Ket wants you to do. It wants you to get real aggressive. fantastic handling of those choppers. The issue with those things is if you let them survive and they get low on the screen, it, it's going to give you a real headache. Moglar, I remember Moglar mentioning that not only is going around the ship like that really swag, but it's also uh, pretty safe to do. The 1-3 boss this boss is a pretty uh, pretty interesting because like in practice and stuff like that I don't ever really necessarily have too much trouble but when I get into runs on this guy uh, his patterns can get a little bit a uh, little bit scary especially this one right here he's about to do so Moglar is delaying the break here to get those chips, yeah. Where normally if he had just kept shooting down there like I do, uh, I would not have gotten all those chips like that. Breaking that side pod, giving himself a little bit of a room out there to move around and stuff. I need to start doing that. And then there, here's this pattern here. So the story with this pattern is that you're supposed to stick close to those the middle blue wall. And as long as you stick close to it, you'll be fine. 
So don't let this pattern psych you out too much. Granted, I seem to have trouble with it, even though I know that, because I tend to wander out too far and get hit, but if you use that exact spot Mogler was doing there, that pattern's not going to give you too much trouble. So there we are. Some amazing gameplay in uh, Stage 1-3. And up next we have Stage 1-4 played by PKE. So PKE is a Japanese player, but what's really cool about him is that he, hang he hangs out with us Western players. So he's in my Discord, he's available, uh, people talk with him all the time, I see him chatting. He was in Shmup Slam too. So the guy is super cool and uh, I, I really like when uh, like Japanese players are more accessible and uh, hang out with us more, basically. And so yeah, PKE, he, he was in Shmup Slam too. He was also in Shmup Vania. So the guy's been around in a lot of different demonstrations, as was Moglar. Moglar was in Shmup Slam too, and Shmup Vania as well. And so, in preparation for this, I actually reached out to him and got a little bit of a history about his, um, the way he got into Shmups. So he was kind enough to give me that information. So he began playing Shmups in 2009. He actually began as a Toho player playing Toho 8. And uh, he was drawn to the game for its music. Uh, PKE was at, in college at the time, so he said he had a lot of free time to sort of throw around and throw at Shmups and Toho. He began with just a normal clear, and then went for hard, and then lunatic, so he built himself up gradually, playing, it sounds like playing for survival. He was drawn into the genre by seeing himself gradually improve. PKE then started playing other Toho games like Toho Scarlet Devil and UFO. And in 2010, he started streaming on Nico, and he actually uh, said that he was taking part in Toho competitions on Nico and going for Toho Lunatic and Toho LNB. And so it was through one of these Toho competitions in 2011 that he came in contact with other players who were also into cave games. And so from there, he started playing Ketsui, and I believe he started playing Ketsui in 2011. And the reason he was drawn to it was because of the music, again, like Toho, and also because he was impressed by the bullet formations, especially on the 1-4 boss. PKE then started with a 1-all, so that's just clearing the first loop. 1-all um, in Ketsui is, among cave games, still pretty difficult. And then from the 1-all, he graduated up to an Emote. And then finally an Aura clear. And it sounds like, reading what PKE said, these, all these clears were actually survival clears, not scoring clears. And so after getting an aura survival clear, he then started learning scoring for the first loop and practicing e-lock, e-locking and all that stuff. So this is kind of an interesting topic that I might do a video on actually is what approach, because most people, most shmup players are always pushing for, you know, that you, if you're going to go for a two wall, if you're going to go for a high score or like a... A significant amount of time you should be playing for score not just survival and I kind of felt that way after Dodonpachi where I spent all this time to get that two wall in the game but don't really have a high score but as I've gotten kind of further away from that experience and stuff I'm starting to see the value of people actually doing more serious survival attempts and stuff like that because I think for some people it's a good way to kind of get to the next level of the genre without too much too much overhead thinking about all the different scoring strategies and stuff like that. So in 2012, PKE then started playing Beat Mania. Um, that's a rhythm game, a very popular one and a very good one from what I understand. And I guess he was having a little bit of frustration with Ketsui, and so he ended up playing mostly Beat Mania for the next six years. And then in 2018, PKE so just two years ago, P uh, PKE returned to playing Ketsui, uh, met Araska, and I'll talk about Araska a little bit more as we go, and then was introduced to the Western Shmup Discords, where he started hanging out with Moglar, KZ, and myself, and all the other Shmup homies. So that's his story of how he went from being a Toho player on Nico to being a Ketsui player hanging out on the... STG Revision 2020 Discord and all the other Western Shmup Discords. So let's get to the run. Absolutely impressive player. 
and a really cool guy. So here we go. Coming into stage four, another fave of mine. The final three stages in Ketsui are just amazing, each and every one of them. Stages one and two are, are good, but for me, I always look forward to playing stages three, four, and five. They're just so well done and so fun. You can see him getting those E-locks off. Look at high, how high his rate counter is. He had it up to 900 for a second there. So I imagine when you start getting really expert in this game and going for you know these top scores, a big push and pull you're probably going to run into is exactly when you're going to spend your rate counter and on what. You know, I think that's a lot of what Ketsui's routing revolves around. That would be my assumption. Moglar can correct me in the chat if that's not right. <laughs> this mid boss is really cool. If you're kind of wanting to just improve your sort of fundamental shmupping skills, I recommend just making a save state on this mid boss and just fighting him for a good couple hours. Because he actually tests you on all lots lots of different fundamental skills, like streaming, being able to shot switch, uh, precisely, all that good stuff. Very good mid-boss fight. Then comes in everyone's favorite enemy, the Nightmare. I believe that's the name of this thing. Wow, I have, I've never... I've never done that before, where he sat on top of him like that. Very risky, but obviously very effective as well. This is another section that's really good to practice, even if you don't play Ketsui, because it's another section that tests some fundamental skills really well, like tracking, moving in really precise uh, little tight areas without overextending. Ooh. Dude is swagging right now. The thing about these nightmares is that you need to put some damage on them because if you don't take them out fast, you can actually get two of them going. And it like the if you take too long, you can get I think you can get two of them on the screen maybe. If not, you can at least put yourself in a really bad situation. I remember having a few situations like that where I didn't put enough damage on him and just got trapped in the corner. The 1-4 boss, a very interesting, very interesting boss fight. This pattern I specifically have a lot of trouble with. A little bit of a brain juggle test. See how many different directions you can watch, because you're getting attacked in all four directions. Very nice taking that out early because, uh, yeah, that last pattern there is not very fun to dodge. I have a vote that that attack where he shows the, throws those blue like spear things, we call that chop suey. That's what I think of whenever I see that pattern. And here we go, around the world pattern. I've been watching super players do this, and uh, I've noticed that I, it looks like it's more effective if you kind of stick a little bit closer to the, the boss when you go around it than I had been doing, where I had been completely out on the walls. Where you noticed he was kind of closer at the beginning there. Probably, you know, you do more damage. Stuff like that. Very 
great gameplay from PKE. And also, thanks again for being cool enough to uh, do that little bio, learn more about him. Because I was kind of curious how a Japanese player ended up, you know, hanging out with it, hanging out with us as much as he does. So yeah, I'm gonna look to the chat for a bit. See any have any clarifying comments from Moglar? Okay, so Mugler is mentioning the part where he got on top of that nightmare as it came in, and I said that was really risky. Mugler is saying he does that to get the chip timer going before killing the nightmare. Otherwise, you can't quick, quick kill it for the six waverns or whatever they're called. So, this is just showing the level of optimization these players are at at this point when they're doing stuff like that. So, that was PKE. And then up next is SPS. And SPS, if you aren't familiar, is most likely the best Ketsui player ever. He is the Aura Type A world record holder at 583.6 million. And the Emote Type A, so that's Tiger, world record at 507 million. So the dude broke 500 million with Emote. And he's the only person to have done that. So that is pretty insane. Um, so he's in the club twice, right? He should have two entries in there. Or maybe he does. And he also has a 523 Ura Panzer Emote. Or Ura Panzer. And he has an Emote Panzer at 481 million. So this dude, like I said, that is pretty unusual. At least compared to something like Dodonpachi, where that would be like... WTN having a 600 mil with CS or something for the heck of it. So it's really cool that they he plays both ships at such a high level. And he is also a former world record holder in Dodonpachi DOJ with Type B. So the guy's the beast. He's, he's probably among some of the best shmup players of all time. And so let's check it out. Let's see what he's got for us. Turn up the audio a bit. Move forward in the. Okay, here we go into stage one five. What's crazy about stage one five too is it's a long stage. It's got a lot going on in it. It kind of feels like two stages shoved together rather than one stage. Also, you can check out the little stage map on the right in the uh, the port. I think that's really cool. I also think it's really cool that he's playing on the PS4 port. You know, that kind of gives me hope, right? Like, imagine if M2 does a Dodonpachi. Oh. Sorry, I don't know why I was getting locked up there. Imagine if uh, WTN did, like, there was a PS4 port and WTN did a... Like a world record score or a top record score on the PS4 port. That would be really cool. The way he's eviscerating all these enemies so quickly really makes the stage look a lot easier than it actually is. That's for sure. Where when you're not as you know of an as much of an expert in the stage layouts and everything as these players are, it does feel honestly like your ship can't handle these many enemies. That it's just impossible. But I think what's interesting about the Ketsui ships is. They do pack a ton of firepower once you know how to use them correctly, especially knowing how to use that, that lock-on mechanic so well. And remember, as I was mentioning at the beginning of the video, when we're talking about the kind of ships and their different frame data, the closer you are, the faster you're going to get those lock-ons. So again, another just another reason why this game is pushing you to play aggressively. He's leaving that ship he kind of let it stall out a little bit. Get some extra chips there. He 
Ooh, that's a really interesting way to handle that pattern. I think I should start doing that. This mid boss is pretty brutal. Especially its final attack here, you'll see. Also, it's pretty awesome that you're fighting this tank in a parking lot. Just the scenery of this game and the aesthetics are among some of my favorites. I think many shmup players feel that way about Ketsui. The aesthetics and the, the scenery, the sprites. Like I said, the tiger especially has one of the coolest ship sprites. I remember talking, Moglar mentioned he felt like the Panzer was his favorite. Um, as far as the aesthetics of the sprites, Panzer also looks pretty cool as well. And personally, I just love choppers. They're my favorite combat vehicle, right? So I'd love to see more shmups utilize these sort of fighter chopper type things. Jet chopper hybrid things. This section here, the, the elevator, the descent, I can't remember what everyone's nickname for it is, but this section is very, very difficult. Um, there's a funny, kind of funny, I don't know if this is a myth, if this is an urban legend, if this is actually documented or as truth, but there's sort of a story of they were going to port Ketsui to the PS2 back in the day, but the reason why they didn't is because of that section there where it scrolls backwards and there's something about the, uh, the PS2 hardware couldn't handle it very well. And when I first heard that story, I was like, okay, maybe these guys are just lazy and that was their excuse. But uh, as I've come into more understanding of how these games are even pushing the 360 more than I expected, perhaps that is 100% true. Like, the, the poor PS2 just couldn't handle the, the bullet hell action here. So, anyway, that's the story of why, um, supposedly, the there was never a PS2 port of Ketsui. So the thing about this back section of the level is I've always underestimated how long it goes on. Like I said, it does really feel like a whole extra level kind of shoved on top of the first half. So these the shadow, whatever, fake shadow rival choppers, you've got to take them out real fast because as you can see here, if they get stacked up and start shooting those huge swarms, it's its curtains. So here we go with the 1 5 boss of Vakineer. I'll be really interested to see how SPS approaches this. Because this first pattern, especially, is something I have trouble with because of the bullets that spawn at the bottom there. My brain has a hard time juggling all the different directions the bullets are spawning from. I notice he's locked onto that guy, that leg there. I think I recall, Mugler's in the chat so he can clarify it. Recall that there's some advantage to doing that where you do more damage than you would normally do or something like that, which is pretty funny. Very precise routing there. It made that pattern look completely trivial, but that's one of those patterns where if you don't know what is going to happen, it's just going to wall you out and kill you. So be mindful of that when you play this yourselves. Being very careful with where he's directing those spawns to go. And then the last, the final attack. Remember when I first came into this thing, I thought, okay, this is just pretty much undodgeable. You just have to, again, be very careful with how you're directing where it's spawning. Very nicely done. You'll notice all bomb stocks, all lives. Of course, he's SPS. That's how he rolls. So this is where we get to the next interesting aspect of Ketsui. Which is, not only does it have a second loop, but the game has two different 
second loops that are pretty different from each other in how they play and how you score them and all that good stuff. And so let's move on and talk about the next loop here, which is the emote loop. So I tried to shove as much information onto this slide as possible. I don't think all of the information is on there, but um, I'll go over it anyway. So what is Ketsui Emote? So Ketsui is the Emote is the second loop of Ketsui, but it's the one, it's like the lesser scoring one, the lesser difficult one. It's basically if you made a few mistakes, so you're getting a second loop, but it's not the ultra special loop, right? So what are the conditions for Emote? The first is that you beat the first loop without any continues. Of course, that makes sense. The second condition is that the sum total of bombs and deaths must be less than or equal to 6. So basically, combined, you cannot die or bomb more than 6 times. So you could die 5 times and bomb once. You could bomb 6 times and never die. You could, you know, you, you get in the math here, right? It's, it's some pretty simple math there. As long as you could die three of each, die three times, bomb three times, you just got to make sure they don't add up to more than six. So what are the changes that happen in Mote? The first one is that proximity doesn't matter anymore when it comes to getting those chips. So all that work you did learning how to get up in people's faces and blow them up and uh, get those big old five juicy five chips, that doesn't matter anymore in Mote. Instead, it's all about the suicide bullets. So now, um, instead of chips being what is uh, going on, you get suicide bullets. And in the emote loop, they are pink. And what you can do is you can seal these bullets when, they, when you are close to an enemy and kill them. Sealing is when, if you're close to an enemy and you kill them, you prevent bullets from spawning or preventing them from firing, depending on the enemy. And in this one, you can do that as well. However, when it comes to scoring, that's not what you want to happen. What you want to happen is actually for these bullets to spawn. And so that's the huge thats the huge difference between Emote and the first loop is these suicide bullets and how you're kind of trying to create them and direct them to where you want them to be. And of course, the difficulty is increased over the first loop conditions. I'll see if there's any more aspects of this that I didn't cover, but those are that's the main gist of it. On a sort of meta level, the big difference is that you're not really playing as aggressively and up in enemies' faces as you were in the first loop, because that's not good for your scoring to do that. So let me double check, see if there's any other aspects of Emote that I neglected to go over. Anything you want to add, Mog, about the uh, emote conditions and differences? The chip number is always one. Like I said, there's no proximity based on side, size or anything like that. Also, too, like I mentioned before, if you're purposely playing for emote, you can actually do some sort of scoring tricks with the bombs in the first loop. I remember... Mogler mentioning that there was a score bomb set up in 1-5 that you could do if you were intentionally going for an emote clear, so yeah, anything else I need to add? Right, well, okay, so let me amend what I said about proximity not mattering. What I meant was that proximity matters, but in reverse. So now, instead of trying to get up in people's faces and sealing bullets now you're trying to stay back and manipulate them to do bombs so i guess proximity matters but in a different way i guess would be a way to state that so let's go to our replay here and so coming into 2-1 emote we have violet hat purple so violet hat purple um i've actually talked to quite a bit uh, he's a little bit of a mysterious player. He doesn't really hang around the discords that I'm aware of and stuff like that. I believe he has roots as a Toho player, but as of late, he's been playing a lot of cave games and doing some pretty impressive scoring survival clears. Uh, the the one that he did last year that was absolutely incredible was a Donampachi DOJ white label to all, and he I believe is the only other you know Western English speaking player to do that other than Pazzy. So. Definitely impressive. And then also recently he's got a Gunbird to all. Yeah, a, a really cool player. 
and I remember coming across this Amote Clear a while back and being pretty impressed. So here we go. Violet Hat Purple. And you'll see here how these these uh, suicide bolts are spawning, and he's wanting them to, you know, appear. He's not trying to get rid of them. I think it's kind of hilarious some of the spawn animations some of these have, right? They seem to just like materialize out of nothingness because the the sprite's gone, but they're still just appearing. A little bit a little bit jank, but uh, I'll forgive you, Concave. I can just imagine, for people who were not prepared to run into this, they'd be like, what the hell is going on here? Like the first time you played a Mote loop and you don't know what, what it's about. And you're trying to like point blank shit and just getting, just getting a, all kinds of suicide bullets coming at you. Looks like he's doing. I'm not again. I'm not an expert with a mote mode clearing, but or scoring. But it does look like he's doing a pretty good job of uh, keeping at that distance to not seal too many bullets. Remember too, the base difficulty is also increased, so these bosses are going to throw different patterns at you than they would in the first loop. It doesn't look like the bullet speed is all that much faster. It's probably a little bit faster, but it's not. It's not like going from Donanpachi loop one to loop two, where all of a sudden you get those psycho bullet speeds. Very nicely done. It didn't look like he did too much milking or anything like that. Just took him out nice and efficient. I believe this was more, it's kind of like a survival clear with some scoring elements, which is kind of the way I play, so I appreciate that. So that was Violet Hat Purple playing uh, Emote mode. I had a little bit of trouble finding as many replays for Emote, which is surprising, right? You'd think it, they'd be all over the place, but. Uh, yeah. So after him, we have the next player, who is, of course, the one and only. No shmup saga is complete without him. Jamers. So, Jamers, uh, he's a legend. What what can you say about Jamers that, you know, uh, hasn't been said? I, he's probably the most well-known shmup player of all time, right? Or he up there, I mean. Um, and he's got an insane library of amazing super plays. Not only does he do such a great job clearing games, but he also does annotations that are really helpful. He was one of the two players that I was most nervous to sort of interact with. I guess I was a fanboy. of I still am a fanboy of his. And I remember when I was about to interview him for the podcast for the first time, I was freaking out. And I felt like I was going to like puke before the, before the recording. So yeah, um, you got to have a Jamers replay. It's not a shmup saga without one, right? And of course, another aspect of Jamers that I really appreciate is that his videos are such high quality too, as far as like uh, capture quality and stuff like that. So here we go. This is a recent one played on the PS4 port, Amote 2-2, playing Tiger. You're probably wondering, hey, where are all the Panzers, Panzer runs? Don't worry, they're coming. It's just, there weren't, I couldn't find too many Panzer Emote runs for some reason, so. Uh, the, a lot of the Emote ones are going to be Tiger. Oh, we got cornered there.
Now imagine that uh, this mid boss is frustrating in any loop. Very interesting how different the the gameplay is between the two loops. Oh, again cornered. Makes sense. There's a lot of a lot of uh, smaller choppers and tanks in this up in this uh, stage, so it makes sense that you probably get walled in pretty quick. We go the tank boss. It'll be interesting to see the pattern changes here. Good maneuvering though. Is Kiwi in the chat? I see a Kiwi. Yeah, welcome to Shmup Saga, Kiwi. We're about halfway through the Emote loop right now. You didn't miss the aura though, so not too late yet. So that was Jamers playing Emote 2 2. And then up next, 2 3, kind of going in the same vein. I think they're from the same country. We have Airpo. And um, the thing I wanted to mention about Erpo is that I'm currently trying to beat his CS uh, CS Dodonpachi record, and so I thought it'd be funny to put him in the 2-3 slot because in Dodonpachi, 2-3 is the, the run breaker. It's like the critical stage. So was, let's see how he does Ketsui 2-3. Erpo, of course, a very, very strong player. Very, very jammers like I would say, where he has all these great scores across many different games, and uh, he actually was on my team in the very first Callus Cup, and uh, he he did some serious damage, and my the team ended up winning. I think a lot of that goes to Airpo for sure. He was putting in the work. Mote two three. Here we go. I'm not surprised he plays Tiger because he plays CS and I feel like, again, the Tiger, just being a Dodonpachi player with some Ketsui tendencies, like, uh, yeah, the Tiger feels really similar to CS, just better, <laughs> just feels be like a better CS, basically. Imagine you could lock on to stuff in Donanpachi. That would be pretty interesting. Someone make that ROM hack. Or they put Tiger in Donanpachi. See how that goes. You can see how important tap dodging and misdirecting and streaming bullets is in a mote like that's it looks like the primary activity of the the loop is lots of streaming lots of tap dodging keeping things 
misdirected as much as possible, doing lots of cutbacks, stuff like that. Again, as I mentioned before, if you destroy this mid-boss correctly, you're going to unlock a an extend. And of course, in the second loop, any extend is going to be extremely critical to get. Very nicely done. This is kind of my way of breaking this thing out, too. That's kind of the way I go about it. Wow. I don't know if it's his capture setup or if it's a mote, but those bullets, those bullets look pretty, pretty fast. This is probably a really interesting section of mote because it's designed to basically kill those things as they spawn. That's what you do normally. But since it's a mote, you kind of have to let them get lower than you normally would. Very clean. Coming into the boss. I could see this guy being insane in the second loop. Yep. I think that's just standard, because I feel like I've seen other Emote 2-3s where they bomb that pattern every as well. Maybe that's just something you do. He's trying to break it to get to that last attack. Oh, for a second I thought that was going to work. I was like, ooh, that's pretty clever, but uh, didn't quite pan out there. Notice when Mog was in 1-3, he was a little bit higher up in that pattern, where in this one, Airbow was further down. I think it depends on the loop where you need to go. Okay, so that was 2-3. Things are really starting to heat up now. So up next we have a Chinese player. I can tell because it's on a Chinese website that the replay is on. So up next is KAL playing 2-4. I don't think either Mog or myself know much about this guy. I can tell you that he's most likely Chinese because he's on a Chinese website, but other than that, I don't, I don't think I know too much about him. Uh, anyone in the chat got information on KAL before we move on? Yeah, that makes sense, Mog. It kind of looked that way just seeing the replays. Yeah, awesome job on the wiki, by the way, Charlene. I got some information and was looking it over before doing this episode actually. Like a uh, like look. Pull it up here. The little uh hitbox diagram, there it is. I used it. Okay, so let's go over to our Chinese player KAL two four Amote. I'm trying to figure out how to full screen this in Chinese. Is that full screen? Okay, looks like a window fan. This is some uh, super player quality video. No shmup slam is or shmup saga is complete without super play quality replays. Is it just me or does that slowdown look kind of strange?
Back to the mid boss. Probably my favorite mid boss in the game. Something funky is going on with the video quality though. I don't even know I don't even know what it is necessarily. I don't know if it's like pixelated or something. I don't it, but it doesn't I don't know. Maybe it's the website too. This isn't YouTube, this is a, a Chinese website. It might not have good uh you know hosting and all that. Oh, that little spite bullet. Did you see it? Just that one little bullet. Man, he's, he's doing excellent work, though. Playing very, very well. That's nice that the uh, suicide bolts aren't too much of a threat in that section. So I can see that becoming really dicey really quick. Very good uh, tap dodging there. That's cool. I gotta try that out. I wonder if that works in the first loop. Probably not, I'm assuming. I was about to say, is he gonna... That's always cool. pattern still doesn't look too bad, but I remember Mogler mentioning that sometimes that pattern can be no problem, and then sometimes it can be a, a pain, depending on what you get. Very nicely done. No miss. And in the emote loop, you know, let those let the bombs flow. No reason not to, right? So now we come up to two five. For two five, we have T K Y. So, thanks to the information from Moglar, T K Y has a five hundred forty one million aura, four hundred ninety five million emote. So he is very close to that 500 million barrier, right? And I believe uh, Mogler says he's almost as good at the Emote loop as SPS. Hence the reason why he's playing 2-5 in the video here. Oops, hold on one moment. Here we go. You can tell he's playing this at an arcade too. Oh, 
So I don't know if you guys saw that, but at the start of the vid, he just flew up the top of the screen and died. Why he did that, why that happened, I'm not sure. Maybe it was to gain bombs? Okay, let's look. Let's, let's find out, because the curiosity levels are too high. Let's go back. So watch this. Okay. I think it's to gain bombs. Because he's got no bombs. Flies up top screen and dies, yeah. It must be to gain bombs. That's some Garega stuff right there. <laughs> I'm assuming that he's going to use these bombs for scoring, and that the gain they provide is going to be higher than the uh, loss of that life. This is like Garega stuff. That's pretty interesting. Keeps killing himself for bombs. Cashing them out on the final stage. Shadow pen or shadow tiger right there. Got the extend. One issue that I've had and I've heard other people have too is sometimes that uh, that panzer will just fly away and fly away with your extend, which could be extremely frustrating. I remember Banana Manic complaining about that. I always, I do always wonder in certain scenarios if cave programs a really, really oppressive pattern with the idea that you're supposed to speed kill the boss before that pattern appears. And you know, th during QA testing, they're like, okay, can you actually dodge this? They're like, nope. <laughs> Just gotta kill the guy before it appears. Kind of like uh, the 2-4 two, two boss in Dodonpachi. Where it has that uh, like needle pattern on that thing, it's like yeah, that that's a crazy one of those kind of types of patterns. Going down to the descent, the elevator, this will be really interesting, the PS2 breaker. It's be interesting, because I assume he's going to have to do uh, some bullet ceiling to keep this within reason. Or maybe just use bombs. There you go. I can tell you that's just pure memorization right there. He just knows exactly where those openings are appearing. Because otherwise, even if you're pretty pretty skilled at shmups, tracking those, tracking that specific attack is very very difficult. Yeah. Oh, 
will be this will be fun. He doesn't have any bombs either. Made it through the choppers there. Okay. The question is, is he going to no-miss this boss? My vote is yes. I think he will. I haven't seen this replay before, so I'm not sure if he will or not. Very cool. <laughs> Going between the bullets. That would be a great clip to use when you're trying to explain hitboxes and bullet hells and shmups. To show him the clip where he's just phasing through those bullets there. Still has a bomb too. Ooh, that was close. Okay, now he's showing off. <laughs> Perfect timing. So that's a mote. Killer score there. So that is a mote. So the next one we will watch. Let's talk about the Ura loop. I believe that's how that's pronounced, right? Ura. That's what I guess said. I'm supposed to pronounce it like that. So, here we are. The special round. The Ura loop. Ura loop, as I say incorrectly. So, what are the conditions? Of course, no continues. But more, more importantly, you no miss, no bomb the entire first loop. So, that's pretty. That's a pretty hefty loop requirement, that's for sure, even for really skilled players. I'd be curious to know how consistently the top, you know, the 500 million club players get into Aura. Like, what, what's their percentage, right? Because uh, in Donanpachi, it's kind of like that, because you can't, you basically have to no miss, no bomb the first loop in that game as well. But I almost feel like Ketsui's first loop is harder than Donanpachi, so it would be interesting to know. The, the percentage. What's kind of your percentage, Moglar? I'll, I'll take this down for a sec to see. What's your What's yours though, Mog? You and PKE, if you know what PKE is like. How often are you getting into Aura? Yeah, catch. I think I definitely think catch me first loops harder. Okay, no percentage. Okay, you gotta you gotta be Prometheus to know the percentages. He, I remember talking with him. He like keeps he keeps track of that. He keeps the percentages of how often he gets into the loop and all that sort of stuff, or how often he you know stays on loop and stuff. So what are the change? Also, there's a score requirement, but from what I understand, uh, that score requirement is not that big of a deal because if you're no miss, no bombing all the way there, you're basically gonna hit that score requirement. 
So, changes. The suicide bullets are faster, they are now blue, and they are more numerous. So you're getting faster, more aggressive, and blue color now. Uh, ceiling bullets does not decrease the multiplier, so now we're kind of flipping it back on its head, where in the emote loop, again, you're trying to kind of play a little more defensively, stay back a little bit, do lots of tap dodging, lots of uh, streaming. In emote, in Ura, or Ura, you're not doing that anymore. Now it's all about aggressive play like before. Uh, ceiling bullets does not ruin your score or anything like that. On the flip, uh, to add to that, the area of bullet ceiling is now smaller. So to get those bullet seals, you got to get even closer than in the emote loop. A stage counter depletes slower, so that means during boss fights, that's going down a little bit slower. I'm assuming that's because the boss fights have more health now, or maybe they're trying to encourage you to do more milking or something. Um, Mogulai can probably clarify why the counter goes slower, or what that means exactly, like how that affects you. Uh, you fight, of course, you fight the TLB Doom at the end of the game, so there's the TLB you gotta contend with. And the end of round bonus is now doubled. So, and I couldn't fit this on the slide, but also the difficulty is increased again. So, Ura, or yeah, Ura is more difficult than Amote, which is more difficult than the first loop. So, this is the, the hardest difficulty of the game. The hardest loop, the hardest difficulty. And, it's not, and I, from what I understand, also demands the most aggression of all of them. So Moglar was emphasizing that it's much, much harder than a Mote, which makes sense. Definitely makes sense. So, oh, twice as hard? That's, that's, that's pretty crazy. So let's get talking about the Ura loop. And the first player we're going to see is a Panzer player. Uh, finally, the Panzers are free. And the person is playing is Oroska. Now, Oroska is a really, really cool dude. I've actually spoken with him a little bit because I interviewed him about the Japanese shmup scene. And from what I understand, he is kind of, a, kind of like the Gus of the Japanese scene, where he's sort of a liaison between the Japanese players and the English players, just like how Gus is a liaison from the English to the Japanese side of things. And so yeah, he's a really cool and also really talented Ketsui player, and so here is his uh, Aura 2-1. There it is, the Panzer is free. So remember, uh, I talked about the differences between the ships. The Panzer is more like the A-type ship from Donanbachi, where it has faster movement speed, but a narrower rapid shot area of coverage. So that's something you need to be very mindful of, of course, when you're routing and playing. And also, its full lock-on speeds are slower than that of Tiger. I think what helps supplement that weakness though is that its movement speed is much faster so you can get close to things faster. And so I think, uh, again, I think all these changes between the ship types is trying to push you to play as aggressively as possible with this ship. A little bit of funniness from the video. I don't think I can pump up the quality, but let's double check that. Okay, we're at full quality. See, he's sitting on top of enemies, sealing them. It looks like you have to get real close to get those bullet seals. Your target and attack. Your mission starts now. 
hopefully the, the video quality is, you can still kind of follow what's going on somewhat accurately. What you'll notice too is just watching this, notice how little he's actually using his rapid shot. He's in lock shot a lot, which makes sense. He's trying to take things out as quickly as possible. Oh. So that was Araska playing 2 1 with Panzer. We are going to start seeing some more Panzer runs. Um, I was going to put more of them in, but felt like with three loops. This, this would go on forever if I, you know, did both Panzer and Tiger for every single stage. Moglar is mentioning that uh, the rapid shot requires less vertical aggression, which makes sense, right? You can uh, hit them from further away with that than you can with the lock shot. I forgot to mention it before, but when you're in your lock shot, that laser that comes out actually does not reach full screen. It um, so you have to be somewhat close-ish to get that to work. So up next we have... I cannot pronounce this. I'm going to say IMA. Um, a Japanese player. And remember from that list we were talking about before. The first two all, I believe. So here we go. This is from the archives. This is definitely some... Uh, v I think it's like a VHS or something like that. Maybe it's a DVD, but it's definitely an older video format, that's for sure. Um, let's see if there's any more information on this player I can share. Yeah, first person to ever get the Katsuri Ura 2 all. I don't know if this video is the first 2 all, probably not, but here it is from the very first player to do it. like impressionistic video quality I'm just noticing uh, you know how often he's using rapid shot where it felt like Roscoe was using it a lot uh, a lot less but maybe you know that's just a stage dependent thing Yeah, you can tell how much more aggressive these bullet speeds are compared to even a Mote. Starting to really kick up the, the speed for sure. This will be interesting to see what the strategy is here. like Jamers did, but even further up. I 
I'd imagine Panzer is probably better for the boss fights because of its increased movement speed. It felt that way when I was doing my one all with Panzer, that the boss fights were were better with them because they're just the movement speed's just faster. You can get to where you need to go without having to switch, you know, over to rapid shot or something. Yeah, that yeah. If you want some real Japanese super player quality, this is the real deal. I mean, you know, it's like uh, belongs in a in a museum, the Smithsonian or something like that. Super impressive, though. You know, to get a aura to all so quickly after the game is released. All right. So the next player we have up is PTK. Um, aura type B loop 1 scoring is on the lower side according to Moglar, but he is very good at aura. His PB is likely a 1 miss, so that's an insane uh, pedigree we got there. So here we are, PTK, and he's playing at the arcade. You can tell when, you, when I pull up the video. Another Panzer. Yeah, look how close he is to these enemies. He's right on top of them. I imagine playing Ura is kind of... Wow, he's going right in between those bullet patterns. It's really fun to watch Panzer though because of how uh, how quick the ship needs to get around. Between. I don't think I've seen that before. Wow, it's like they took loop one and they're just playing it back and fast forward. It seems so much faster. Looks like the strategy still works. That would be cool, Charlene, if you could switch ship types on the fly. That would be really cool. I'd dig that, for sure. Like, if they made an arrange like that. So up next we have OCG. Um, according to Moglar, OCG is the only known player to have no missed Ketsui Ura. So this dude has no missed the entire game. His loop 1 score is the lowest of any 500 mil player in the mid 240s, but he doesn't use because he doesn't use Zako e locking, does not play Emote. So this guy is all about the Ura. No miss. Wow. 
So this would be pretty great. That's pretty crazy. So 2-4 played by OCG. Here we go. Oh, Mog wanted to also mention that his PB is 536 million. Why doesn't it look right? Oh, huh. this isn't an om. This isn't a. That's on the index. Whoops. Okay. That's okay. Easily fixed. Easily fixed. So what we'll do is we'll just uh, watch the next players play two stages, right? Nothing wrong with that. Because the next player we have coming up is Pazzy. So Pazzy, again, kind of like Jamers, does he really need much introduction? One of the most popular shmup players around. Uh, definitely one of the most skilled Western players. Sort of in some kind of retirement or left the genre, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, not, not a whole lot of activity or contact with him. I think some people still kind of keep in touch with him, but for the most part, he's kind of hard to get a hold of. So why not? Let's watch some Pazzy 2-4 while we're at it. I'll just jump back in the replay a bit. Actually, not a problem at all, because I have an idea of what to do with 2-5 anyway. So here we go, Pazzy with the, the swag hand cam, you gotta appreciate that. Keyboard player. This is obviously the version without annotations, but uh, yeah, there is a version of these runs with annotations you can check out. They're very, very useful for learning more about the game, learning more about you know, his routing, his strategies, all that stuff. You know, definitely gems. Yeah, it's probably something like that. That's okay, we can just watch Pazzy play. Not a big deal. Oh, those little blue bullets, those are definitely pretty filthy. I can see why the boss timer is slowed down. It's, it feels like these fights go on longer than they do in the first loop. There's that spite bullet. He's growling. It's like this damn game, man. He's probably feeling a little bit of nerves too, because he's like, okay, I'm on pace here.
take just get him out of there. Here we go. Two four boss. This will be interesting. That sort of safe spots strategy. It's not necessarily a safe spot, but it kinda is. Still works, it looks like. Oh wow. He was running out of room there. Is that just a regular keyboard? It is, right? Is that mechanical or is that just a regular keyboard? It's kind of hard to tell. Oh, okay. Maybe his mic just isn't very loud. So I'd expect it to hear it really clattering and clacking as he plays. Yeah. You pretty much just gotta bomb that, right, Mog? Or bo bomb it if you have any chance to. That's Pazzy. I definitely recommend you checking out his annotated run. And so up next, I'm making a little bit of a change in the schedule. This will be really cool though. So for 2-5, we're going to watch none other than the world record holder himself. And not only will it be the world record, but let's see him perform this live. So this is a classic video for those who remember or I've seen it before this is the stun fast run where he plays it live also enjoy the French commentary <laughs> Nerves of steel, man. What's crazy is on the replay index, this was played live and it's really high up on the replay index too. Look at how uh, just frantic the uh, the routing looks. Just have to be constantly on the move. Got the extend. Coming to the parking lot. Ah là on voit le, le moteur qui est à genoux, on voit la grosse chute de... Ouais. 
Oh man. Yeah, I was talking about that earlier, Mogler, how Banana was talking about the, the chopper just flying off with your extend. Ketsui never did Ketsui ever receive any revisions? I don't think it did, right? It's just the one version of it. Because you would think in one of the revisions they would say, okay. Wow. The tanks did tanks be nasty. Maybe they could do an arcade mode plus in, M in the M2 port, and all they do is make it sh make it so that chopper doesn't fly off. That's too. It had two later revisions. I'm assuming the ROM that we all play is the latest revision. Remember, th this descent is just brutal. I'm pretty sure, like I said, I'm pretty sure he just hard memorizes that entire sequence down to the exact little spots he needs to dodge. Yeah, I was just kidding. I wasn't serious about them doing that. It's just kind of one of those, I guess, sort of random RNG elements. Wow. Working your way through those is always really, really tough, even in the first loop. What a crazy attack when you think about it, that, that tank attack where it blasts the shotgun blast but then the bullets like rebound back and then slingshot forward. It's pretty interesting. That's what I'm saying that's what I was saying about Ketsui earlier on is that it has a lot of really interesting bullet patterns and stuff like that. They're pretty different from the stuff you see in Dodonpachi and those types of games. Hey, back in here. This pattern looks like a brain buster. The ropes. This kind of reminds me a little bit of the DOJ pattern, but way better. He's holding those bombs. He's not giving them up. I wonder if he'll use one on the final pattern. Hey, here he goes. Doom time. From what I understand, Doom is one of the more fair TLBs in the cave games. Oh, 
Less, less, uh, BS. Like in Dota Baji where the patterns speed up and stuff like that. The French commentators mentioned something about Dota Baji. They were probably saying, this TLB is way better because the patterns don't randomly speed up at the end. Ooh. Again, that's another kind of like brain teaser pattern. Still has not bombed. Ooh, just in time. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, out of bombs. Now he's just got to dodge. If he wants to no miss. Wow. Very, very impressive boss fight. You can't see it in the camera because the chat's sitting on top of it, but he kind of popped off. After he got the, the no miss, he like jumped up and popped off a little bit. Which is absolutely understandable. What a run. That's got to feel good. Fly out to Stunfest and get a 500 mil live in front of this massive crowd. That's got to be a good feeling. Killer gameplay, killer gameplay. So, I thought it wouldn't be right to end this out without uh, showing one more little, uh, one little extra before we get into the arranges and the different versions. Which is our pal, Moglar, doing his very own Doom No Miss. So, here we go. I remember you submitted, I think Moglar submitted this to Slam 1. So this is a... This is a classic. Gotta love the drum. In the OST. Yeah. I love the snare. That's the that's the part I really like. Or whatever that is, it's some kind of snare thing. He's not hitting that bomb button. I'm not seeing bombs. Not yet anyway. Wow. That is so impressive. That looks like a really fun pattern though, I'm not gonna lie. I remember enjoying it when I play uh, Destiny mode. Excellent gameplay. So that was a no miss, no bomb doom from our very own Moglar. Oh, gotta listen to that sound effect. <laughs> That's the challenge mode. Alrighty, so let's take a look here. Um, we might take a short break. Or maybe I'll just power through. Maybe we'll just power through, actually. So those are all the replays I have for the arcade version of Ketsui, though there are some extra versions of the game I thought would be interesting to cover. The first one being, let's start off with the fun one, which is the Death 
death label DS port. So Ketsui actually had a handheld port for the Nintendo DS. It's pretty expensive if you want to buy it or you can emulate it. And it's actually pretty cool, I have to admit, um, where it's a, a boss, sort of a boss rush, but also has some little stages and stuff like that. And so the replay I want to show here is Jamers uh, clearing, I think it's some kind of special extra stage in the in the port, so or in the handheld version. Which is pretty pretty hilarious and awesome that they put Ketsui on the DS. Um, I kind of wish they would do more of that sort of stuff, so... Here we go. Ketsui for the Nintendo DS. Oh, Mog, you can just put it in... Just put it at the very top of the document. Just at the very top. Yeah, you can't you can't talk about Ketsui without talking about Death Label. So this is our very own Jamers playing this in emulator. I can see. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I do the same thing myself. And uh, yeah, so this is stage uh, sort of based off stage one five. You can tell, but it's got its own thing going. It's doing its own thing. It's funny how weird the the clone ones look, but the uh, the main character sprite looks pretty dang close to the the original arcade one, just a little more low res. This is one of my favorite shmup boards, just because it's so silly and creative, and it's actually pretty fun to play. You know, like uh, I played on my. Uh, 3DS from time to time. That's like the Saturn explosion animations on Donobachi. They look they look like that low res explosion. This does look fairly challenging though. Oh wow. Oh, that's an auto bomb. No, oh, that's a I think that's a death actually. We're still going. The parking lot's flooded. I'm pretty sure he's going to come up against the mid-boss. Nope. Guess not. That's surprising. Yeah, I have no idea what the different cubes and all that mean. It could just be for for style, you know, like the the one cubes are blue and so forth. I'm not sure though. It looks like all the one cubes are blue though. And why the cubes are turning tan, I'm not entirely sure. So the PS2 couldn't handle it, but the Nintendo DS got you covered, baby. Of course I'm kidding, because uh, the DS, they're just using the background, right? Where in the PS2 version, I'm sure they were trying to actually run the stage as is or something like that, but I feel like there could have been a workaround if they really wanted to make it work. Oh, Magda was saying the yellow ones are the ones you get when you're locking onto enemies. That makes sense. Your mission starts now. Are you ready? Oh, it goes right to Doom. Doom's got lasers. Ooh. 
Oh wow. Ooh, it's a gnarly pattern, especially since he's so low on the screen. It's like right there. Here we go. This is familiar. Down to one extent. So that was. That was down to the wire, especially right there. It looked like that uh, that last dodge was going to be a real tough one. Nicely played, nicely played. Okay, so we got two more ranges to talk about before we close for the evening. Uh, the first one I'm a little bit more familiar with, so we'll start with that, which is Katsui Destiny. And so this is the range mode, of course, included with the PS4 port of the same name. It is actually a really, really fun range mode. I enjoy it a lot. I don't know if I'll ever really get into heavily scoring Katsui's arcade mode, but I could see myself in the future spending a lot of time trying to get a, a big old score in Destiny mode. So we got a run here from Moglar. I don't think I'll show the entire run, but I'll just go ahead and jump up to stage, let's say stage three, and we can kind of take it from there. Or maybe halfway through stage three, how about that? And we'll take it from there. So the big change, well, this is actually a lot of big change, but the big big one is the, the way this cube system works here, where you have these blue cubes, and when you collect those, they fill up your meter at the bottom there. And then what you want to do is once your meter is full, you want to expend it and start leveling up your hyper levels or whatever you call it. And... Uh, Basically, the, the higher you get your hyper level, the more lucrative you're going to get those big gold cubes. The thing about it, though, is there is a risk-reward where in this version of the game, there are no bombs. Instead, you have an auto-bomb type feature that works when your meter turns yellow like that. You see how his meter was yellow? That's when your auto-bomb is, act is uh, available to be used and when you're able to hyper. And so, it's kind of like Crimson Clover, where when you're going into those really high-level hypers, the big risk there is that if you get hit, you're dead, right? There's no, there's no sort of defense, so you got to really be on point. But of course, the point of doing that is you get a much larger scoring item, scoring cubes. Another interesting aspect of this range is that there's this thing called death-die mode, where if you... If you have to do these certain really simple requirements in the first stage where you get a level, I think like a level 3 hyper or level 4 hyper um, in the mid stage, I think it's before the death of the mid boss or somewhere in there. 
I talk about this a little bit in more detail in my actual podcast about this with Iconoclast. If you guys want to check that out, we go real in depth on this mode where he actually played in this competition when it was first released and ended up winning it and winning a cool prize and everything. But anyway, so when you unlock death and die mode, what you do is you hold bomb and then the game becomes, I believe it's like aura level attack patterns, but without suicide bullets. I believe is how it works. Mogar can definitely correct me in the chat if that's incorrect, but I believe that's how that works. And so that death there was intentional. And so the interesting thing about this mode is it kind of has a Garega-like quality to it where you gain extends by scoring and then you can sacrifice or suicide those extends to gain meter, which then you can use to get even more score. Very, very similar to how Garega works. I think that was kind of the idea. The really cool thing about this arrange is that it kind of works for everyone. It can be played in many different ways. For example, if you're a newish shmup player, this arrange is actually really, really good because you get lots of lives and you get lots of auto bombs to protect you. So you can actually learn the game and get an easier clear than you would in the arcade mode. However, if you're an expert player and you want to play this game for score, there's still a lot of room there because what you need to do is you need to sacrifice your meter to get uh, higher cubes anyway, so you're not going to use it for auto bombing all that much. And also, you need to sacrifice all those extra lives to gain more meter. So it balances itself out itself out in a really nice way, without directly using rank, which I think is really cool. And instead of using like the, a soft sort of rank system, it simply has a manual rank system that you turn on, which is death die, right? So whenever you get hit. Death Die will deactivate, so you gotta reactivate it if you want it, or if you don't want it, you can just leave it deactivated. So, again, I think that's a really cool idea, really cool move. I recently did a, a clear of it where I was in Death Die mode for the most part. I don't, I wasn't in it during Doom, and there are a few spots here and there where I wasn't in it because I didn't realize I had deactivated it. But other than that, I spent a lot of time. And it's actually a really, really fun mode. That's why I'm thinking about, at some point down the line, starting to play it for score. So, TLDR, it's definitely worth the price if you uh, are so inclined to purchase the PS4 version of the game. On top of all the other great stuff that's in the PS4 version. Yeah, it is, it is very straightforward, I feel. Um, I think the real routing aspect of it, at least when I talked to Icon about it, was figuring out where you're going to suicide and where you're going to use your hypers and when. But it does seem a bit more straightforward than the arcade version when it comes to all that. Also, another thing to mention is this version does not have two loops. It's a one loop, one loop game, and you fight Doom at the end.
Here we go. Stage five. It'll be interesting. So one thing about this is that your extends are not cashed out at the end. They don't. They aren't worth anything. So one way or another, he's going to suicide away these extends most likely to uh, gain more meter. He had to reactivate Death Die because he died. That hyper is really handy. The hyper is really handy in certain situations, especially in boss fights. Oh, I bet he's going to really try and uh, build up his meter here for after the boss dies in the popcorn rush afterward. I could see this section being really lucrative. Level two. Level three. Suicide to level four. Perfect. Yeah, that's going to be a ton of points. I love the giant gold boxes. It's so satisfying. Again, it reminds me of Crimson Clover with the stars and stuff when you double break. Yeah, exactly. Might see another suicide, yeah. Because if you play kind of kind of conservatively, you can uh, clear the bosses pretty easily with one one life if you if you abuse the auto bomb system. So I wouldn't be surprised if Moglar suicided all his extends away before the before the final boss. Though he may also hold on to one just for safety's sake as well though.
Yeah, getting there with two. That makes sense. That way you're not yeah. giving yourself a little bit of a cushion. So what's funny is, uh, yeah, this, this boss fight is actually, for me, it feels like it's harder than Doom in this mode, specifically. Back in here. Or pretty close. Difficulty. Level 3. He's gonna get a huge break here, yeah. Saving up that meter. And here comes Doom. Having that auto bomb on this boss is so helpful. <laughs> So uh, Mog hasn't used it yet, he's going uh, getting some pretty nice level ups and stuff like that. He's keeping, yeah, he's keeping an eye on that uh, meter. Very wise. Yeah, I know what you mean. It is kind of a, uh, a disappointing feeling when you clear the boss with like four extends and they're worth absolutely nothing. It kind of makes you be like, okay, I should have. It's the game telling you you should have played more uh, aggressively at some point or taken more risk. I know that because it happens to me all the time whenever I play that uh, Destiny mode. Okay, so the last thing we're going to load up here is the IKD special. So this is a version that recently became available in the M2 port alongside with Destiny. So that's pretty crazy that there are two different ports along uh, inside that release. One moment. I'm gonna pull up the video here. Okay, so let me go over the differences. IKD special. Both patterns are usually either loop 2 versions or different than both loops, with the difficulty being between 1 and 2. So it's kind of a difficulty between an Ura and an Emote, or Ura and an Emote. Proximity system is much more brutal. You have to be extremely close to enemies. However, you don't need a timer to get higher value chips in this mode. If you point blank with Lockshot, you can get some high value chips. This is often used on mid bosses. So. That's pretty different. You only start with one. You only start each life with one bomb. You get a total of five bomb stocks if you no miss no bomb, up to stage five boss. So you only respawn with one bomb. After each stage, you will get an extend if you collect more five chips than one chips. Oh, that's pretty cool. If Akinir's final phase is replaced with Doom, just like an Ura. So yeah, there's no uh, there's Doom. It's a one loop one. Due to fighting Doom, the game thinks you are an aura, 
starting at a Vacuneer, so the end's bonus is double of stage 5. This coupled with the bomb situation makes this mode quite punishing on survival. Very, very interesting. Yeah, it sounds like a pretty interesting mode. Maybe I'll have to give it a go one of these, like, uh, pretty soon here. But yeah, let me pull up the video. So we're gonna watch Araska play Destiny IKD Special 2007. We're not going to watch the entire thing. Instead what we're going to do is we're going to jump to stage 4, about halfway through stage 4, and then watch stage 5. So that's stage 5. Here we are, stage 4 mid boss. Look at the amount of extends he's got built up there. And from what I understand, this was an actual PCB that was released, but you could only play it at one select event. But now you can play it on the uh, De Destiny port, which is really cool. So the port is not only giving you more range is also sort of preserving an arrange that might otherwise be you know it's kind of like a campaign type situation where it's just sort of locked away forever for most people that's why I'm really hoping with the Dodonpachi if they do a Dodonpachi port that they get a campaign included on there so we all can play it finally So while this is playing too, I just want to thank uh, everyone who really helped out a lot with the Shmup Saga episode, of course. Moglar being the MVP, Moglar put in an insane amount of work helping me out, you know, as an advisor, helping me kind of make sure the information is accurate and giving me information that I wouldn't have found on my own otherwise. And also shout outs to Plasmo for helping me out with that uh, scoring table information and helping with the player bios and all the, that good stuff. And also, a thank you to Patoing. He hooked me up with a stage map of the game. I didn't end up using it in the episode because uh, the way Ketsui's stage map looks, it's just like half blank. And so I thought, well, okay, it's kind of half blank, so I don't know if I... It's not as uh, fun to use as the Dodonpachi one was. So I decided to kind of scrap the idea, but thanks to him anyway for hooking me up with that. Even though I didn't end up using it. And yes, uh, IKD is just one loop. It's interesting. It's kind of an interesting idea, right? Make the difficulty somewhere between Ura and Emote. Man, look at him. He's sitting on some serious, uh, resources right now. I'm really curious to see how stage 5 turns out. But like Moglar said, you have to get real close to get those 5 chips, but it sounds like, and Moglar can correct me, it sounds like you can get 5 chips while in lock shot, so you don't have to switch to rapid shot anymore to do that. Is that, is that correct, Moglar? That's pretty cool. That's a cool idea. Gives the game a, a different feel, for sure. It's just basically, get close and kill him. Doesn't matter what shot type you use. I could see how this mode would be really fun to play as, pan, as Panzer. 
because of the way the ship works, where you're just mauling people and flying around all fast. Oh, okay. So if you start the timer, you don't need to point blank. So you just need to get that initial start and then you can fly around and kill stuff with your lock shot. Oh, damn it. damage. So I'm assuming this is not like... Remember, Moglar was saying that you get the double end stage bonus because it thinks it's Ura, so those lives are probably worth a lot of points. Unlike Destiny, where they're worth nothing. That makes sense. That's really cool. It is interesting how small changes to certain little like way scoring mechanics work in these games make such a large difference to the overall strategy and feel of the game, right? Oh, that's cool. That's real cool. That looks like that's an IKD thing, right? That doesn't happen in the Aura Loop, does it? The way they kind of melt around the ship like that. coming up on the PS2 breaker. Oh, it's an emote thing. Okay. Very nice. He just got right up in that grill. It's kind of funny how when you watch really skilled players, it just makes the game look so much easier than it actually is. It kind of makes you feel a little bit dumb when you're watching, like, well, okay, really? You just have to fly up there and point blank them, and I've been dying to this for a year now? But then when you actually go to try it, it's like, okay, this is kind of complicated. Yeah, that is a weird change. Tiger. He needs to get real close to get those lock-ons nice and fast. Here come the Panzers. It's just taking them out as they spawn, no problem. So for the high score, I can imagine he's really wanting to hang on to these lives as much as possible. I bombed the first pattern there as well. I find it uh, find it harder than the other patterns for the most part. Let's 
that's a good way to go about it. Let's do it. Almost there. Just gotta make it through this. Because the, the final pattern uh, is replaced with Doom, as Moglar mentioned. Doom time. That was rough. Pattern's so crazy. Is that pattern static, Moglar? Like, is it the same from run to run, or does it change a little bit from run to run? The one with all the blue little bullets you have to kind of quickly dodge around. Dang, random. Of course it's random. It's a TLB, right? They're not going to give you an easy... An easy out. The ship's dancing. I just love how creative the patterns in this game are. They feel creative without feeling cheesy, if that makes sense. Where some shmups have creative patterns, but they're a little bit cheesy. To where you're, you feel like the pattern is just trying to show off a little bit. But in Ketsui, it doesn't feel that way. They just feel very creative, but in a in an organic sort of way. Got no bombs. Got no bombs. Yeah, that that was rough. It's got one bomb. So you gotta really know your stuff when you're fighting Doom, because you're not gonna get any free res you're not gonna get many resources outside of him. Awesome. Oh, I was hoping the credits would play. Alright, one moment. Okay, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. I really appreciate everyone coming by and checking it out. I hope you all enjoyed and learned a little bit more about Ketsui. I definitely learned more in the process of creating this in this video, if that means anything. So, yeah. Shoutouts to everyone. Any final words before I close this down? Yeah, the full VOD will be up really soon because, uh, yeah, it shouldn't take much editing or anything like that. I don't really edit shmups, shmup sagas all that much, so... Yeah, just uh, chop down the beginning a little bit and clean up the audio and it should be up very soon. Alright, well, thanks so much for tuning in, everyone, and a shout-out to anyone who actually sat through the whole thing. These these bad boys are a marathon. That's for sure. So, yeah. That's it. Thanks for tuning in, everyone.